they need to jump off uh, and then introduce uh, Angie as our guest. If you'd like to, uh, do you think that's a, a good idea? I think it's a great idea yes. if you want to okay. do that. Right. I, know that, I always uh, learn something from them anyway. I know John's here. I know Brian's here. I saw Don Don pop in. Um, so uh, John, if uh, if you'd like to start things off with uh, mortgage, that'd be awesome, my friend. Absolutely. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Well, first of all, I I plan on staying on the call just to kind of hear what Angie has to say. Angie, I appreciate you being on the call. Um, you guys are on the front lines of getting new properties and getting these transactions completed. So we really appreciate that. Um, a quick update as far as on the lending side goes, uh, we did announce that we have reopened the H and the plus programs. We're actually the only uh, Virginia's bond program is the only bond program that the company is allowing as far as the, the down payment assistance and the grant side. So that's pretty cool. I mean, um, it's a big win. And that took a lot of coordination with the HGA and Prosperity to kind of open that back up. So hopefully that's a sign. One thing is um, uh, FHFA announced yesterday some guidance on some of the secondary market requirements for loans that are in forbearance, specifically the amount of time that servicers have to pay the pass through for loans that are in forbearance and also um, guidance on um, how a loan is treated when it's in forbearance that, you know, basically not considering it to be in, in default, which is very important for the secondary markets. And that's a lot of that uncertainty is what has driven um, the enhanced credit guidelines. And it's also driven um, the suspension reduction of programs that you're seeing on the market. So I think that's a, a positive movement. I think we're going to see some, um, some thawing in the markets um, as far as some loosening in the guidelines. I don't know if it's going to be today or, or tomorrow or next week, but it's coming. So it's a good sign. We're seeing a lot of positivity in the market, a lot of pent-up demand. We're seeing rates stay low, and the government is going to ensure the rates are going to stay low right now and uh, going forward. They're going to pump money into the mortgage-backed security system to kind of uh, prop up rates to, to stimulate the economy to keep them low, which so that'll be a positive going forward. I mean, one thing is we are seeing a tremendous tsunami of refinance applications moving through the system. And that is, it's basically like we're having, we're seeing record months as far as applications for the company and, and, and throughout the country, they're seeing similar things. So it's, it's taxing operations to a degree, just like it would be in the peak um, summer months, right? Uh, late spring, uh, summer months when we're seeing peak volume, but we're seeing it earlier in the year. So it's interesting considering purchases are lower than they normally would this year, but just so many refis coming through. So what that does, and this is not just true for us, but every lender is, it, you know, every loan requires attention. Every loan, especially nowadays with um, all the, the updated guidelines with uh, you know, requirements for verifications of employment, um, they're just requiring a little bit more time. So a byproduct of that is we're seeing a little bit uh, longer turn times for things, a little bit. We're seeing um, you know, closing dates. We, we basically, long story short, is we cannot move up a closing date. So if we had something where, like, hey, generally we would have some flexibility of, look, we really want to close this now, move it up, you know, a couple of weeks because we, that's what people want. We really need to be hesitant to do that because I don't want to make a promise um, to you guys to say, hey, yeah, I can do it, and then and then we can't do it because we should, from a volume standpoint, they they can't get to it in time. So. Just keep that in mind. I know we kind of have had similar points previously, but try to give yourself from a transaction point of view at least 30, 45 days um, from the, the from ratification to get us to the finish line. It's just going to be more, a smoother transaction for everybody. Um, I just want to put that out there. So, I mean, we, I'm seeing every day if we're on the buyer side and there's a domino transaction where the, um, the buyer's house needs to sell before they can purchase. I'm seeing a lot of those lenders 
uh, push back closings. Uh, quick in, Bank of America won't even take uh, you know, less than 45 days. They're, they are swamped. They can't handle the volume. They're not staffed to do so. We are prioritizing purchase applications over refinances when it comes to closing dates. They're not even allow. They're not even allowing refinances to close the last week of the month right now, just to ensure that we have um, sufficient operational capacity to close those purchase transactions. So that's you know, one big thing that we're doing. In fact, it's the it's the first week in the last week, um, or the only, basically you can't close any refinances. They're making us push those back. Um, so really, we can only close refinances the second, third week of the month. So that is what it is. Again, that's the, for us. That's the most important thing. Is this, the, you know, and a lot of other companies are, are not taking that stance. They're kind of the first come, first serve, pushing back closing dates, and we really want to not, not do that. But with that said, again, you know, we can't move any closing dates up. That is one thing I will. I've, I've tried and I've been shot down. So um, to put that out there, but you know. We're seeing a lot of positivity on the appraisal side as far as things coming back. We thought that would be a big bottleneck for us with the volume coming through, but appraisers have been super efficient with usage of the desktop and um, you know, the new guidelines with allowing them maybe stay at home more than they would otherwise and do some more stuff from their house, um, be more efficient. So we're seeing turn times for appraisals actually within normal guidelines, so which is impressive with the volume that they're they're doing. So we're not seeing a, a lot of um, issues there. Obviously, I'm sure Angie will talk, touch on maybe some of the stuff going on with COVID and or the flexibility that she has regarding having to go and go into a property or not. But um, appraisal, the appraisal process seems to be working well for us. Other lenders um, uh, may have some issues with some delays on the appraisal side, but other than that, rates are still again fantastically low. Um, we're we're seeing rates in the um, the low threes for conventional and and um, uh, FHA and VA. Uh, again, right now we still have a minimum credit score requirement of 660. We do anticipate that loosening up soon. We don't know again when that's going to be. Hopefully, sooner rather than later. But that is um, the you know the one thing that we hope to see some uh, some loosening on. Um, other than that, does anybody have any specific questions about what's going on or about programs in general? I would have asked you about the. Uh the credit score, but it sounds like we're still at 660. So thank you for, for answering that. Um, I think VHDA coming back is really, really big in this area. I mean, that's a big part of what we do, a lot of first time buyers. Um, and so I'm excited to have access to that product again. I think that's awesome, awesome news and good for prosperity. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're, we're happy to bring that back. It's a big part of our business down here. Cool. Thank you, John. Appreciate the uh, appreciate the update. Appreciate you being here. Thank you for the information. Um, Brian, uh, over at Sage, do you have? Uh, I understand that you guys are doing all total like curbside closings now. Is that well, right? yeah, mainly yes, that's correct. Um, just a shout out to the office there with uh, capture year to date is one hundred percent, which is amazing. So there's a contest looming, and I, I think we, you, the whole office is going to be really shining high on that. Um, to be this late and have 100% for year to date is amazing. So I want to thank everybody who's on that call and who's not, because um, that's amazing. But yeah, we're doing um, curbside or at a table outside now. If they if it's cash, we can do Hello Inc. and they don't have to come in now. If they insist on somebody coming to their house, we can dial up Notary Rotary or it's um, Notary Loop is the technical name and see if they would agree to come to their house, say somewhere, and and try and work that out. But but me corporate has me sticking in the office during this time. So it's you all two paths, as uh, Jeff Detweiler said in his email earlier. So uh, I'll be anxious to get out, but oh, I've saved a ton of money on gas. I used to put three and 400 miles at least on every week. Now I'm like saving money and gas prices down. So it's like getting a raise for me. That's right. 
<laughs> that's, right. that's great. Yeah. All right, my friend. Thank you very much. I'm glad you're here. I appreciate the information. Uh, Dawn, how's uh, how's insurance business looking today? Insurance business is looking great. I don't have any bad things to report. Like I said last time, it's business as usual for us because everything is done virtually. So I'm just quoting and issuing policies like crazy, thanks to you guys. So all is good in the insurance world. That's awesome. Hey, did, uh, <laughs> did you see the year-to-date insurance capture rate? I did, and I was trying to find it, but I couldn't pull up my email. I, I have it. It was uh, 57%. Nice. I knew we had gone up because you guys are incredible giving me chances with your clients, yeah. so thank you for that. We were the uh, number one office for insurance market share capture. Sweet. Uh, and, thank uh, you guys <laughs> very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Don. Yeah, thank you for being so proactive and so awesome to work with. Well, I, mean, I think that uh, it's definitely a team effort, and we would not uh, be so successful without you and, and your help. Well, you guys are awesome, and you're, you make it easy to work with, so I appreciate it. Sweet. Okay, guys, uh, any questions for core partners? Then without any further ado, let me introduce to you Angie Miller. She uh, She's a local appraiser. Uh, she's awesome, and uh, and hopefully she's going to uh, share with us some tips to uh, to get through this difficult market and let us know, you know, what updates she might be seeing on her end as an appraiser under this COVID-19 quarantine pandemic uh, that we're all struggling with. So, uh, Angie, please take it away. All right. Hey. So, I went up to this house to do a final inspection. And normally it's like, hi, my name is Angie Miller, real estate appraiser here to do the check on the things that we needed to repair. She, uh, the homeowner immediately started screaming at me, telling me that I deprived, there's something, oh, okay. There's some noise coming through on somebody's. You want to mute? <laughs> Sorry. I can hear like a little piano or something. Sorry. So the homeowner um, uh, starts screaming at me that I have deprived their children of their necessary items because of the repairs that I called for in order to be able to close the loan. So then I'm like, okay, this is not going well. So we walk outside to take a look and I, you know, she points up at the dormer and says, do you see that up there? You, you, my husband risked life and limb in order to go repair that stuff. And I said, well, you know, the bank requires that these kind of things be repaired in order for the loan to close. And she just started screaming. It didn't go anywhere. And she, what she said after that was, you don't care if my husband lives or dies. Uh, that's not what I said, <laughs> but guess what? I don't want that same situation to happen to your clients. It happened to this one. She wasn't prepared to have to do repairs in order to be able to get into this house uh, or, you know, in order to sell. And so I just don't want the same thing to happen to your clients. And that's one of the reasons that I talk at agents meetings is so that that doesn't happen. So one of the very first things I want to talk about is, um, did you um, email everything, that folder to all the agents, John, Jason? Um, you know? Stacia, I know I sent it to Stacia. I don't know if it got sent out. No. You know if it got sent out? Hang on. She's got to unmute herself. Well, if not, you will get a copy of it. Yeah. What folder? So she sent us a <laughs> uh, she sent us a package of information to share with the agents. No, no, so no, no. You I thought you I had sent it to you. Only forwarded me that she was coming on April twenty second. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> we'll make sure, audit. Angie, that uh, everybody gets it. Um. Yeah. Just forward it to me, and I can. <laughs> What did you say, Stacia? I said, uh, I told Jason to just forward it to me right now and I'll attach it. Okay. All right. So um, uh, this is an FHA property observation checklist and on it is everything that an appraiser has to check for. Mm -hmm. So when you have a homeowner 
that they're like, well, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do this on the house. You can blame it on the appraiser and say, look, this is all the things that an appraiser is going to judge for on an FHA loan and have most of this on a VA loan. Not most of it. I don't do FHAs anymore because I didn't want to be a home inspector and crawl up in the attic so <laughs> and look around a ladder. <laughs> so I dropped FHA. But in terms of VA, it's almost as strict. So if you can go through and tell your homeowners, listen, if you accept a VA or an FHA loan, you're going to have to fix this stuff. So why not take care of it before we even list the house? And so this is a super handy thing for you to highlight to be able to show your. Um, agency information and you'll be getting a copy of that in your email. So um, one of the biggest things, this is my first um, quiz, I, there's a poll thing called Poll Everywhere and um, so I'm going to do my first poll and so what you need to do is I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. All right, so what you need to do is I've activated this poll. And so you need to text 22333 on your phone. Everybody get out their phones and text 22333. And after you have it, um, text Angie Miller 392 in there, and that'll get you activated to run the polls. Miller 3. I tested it. You don't have to worry about, yeah. Just two, two, three, 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 shade act, and then that's the phone number. And then you text Angie Miller 392, and that's my polling number. And then the question is what is the number one item repair that is called for? that I call for. I'm not going to speak for other appraisers. Paint the exterior trim, repair the rotten wood, or caulk along the tub, or put down shoe molding along the tub, or all the above. Which one do you think is the top repair? So we have one vote in. <coughs> Anybody having problems? Yep. Right. There we go. That's a pretty cool tool, isn't it? <laughs> that is kind of neat how it just shows up live like that. That's neat. Yeah, you can do, there's all sorts of uh, things that you can do. We'll do another one just for the heck of it. That's just a fun one right after this. Another okay. toy for JJ. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay, so everybody done there. Uh, I don't even know how many responses show how many it tells me how many responses. So uh, paint the exterior trim, repair rotten wood. Yeah, it actually is all the above. Mm. Okay, but my all the above, I best could be could be actually be taken two different ways. Exterior trim and rotten wood. Huge, 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 huge. FHA VA loans. You got to do it. And the caulk around the tub or the shoe molding along the tub, all three are ways for water to get into the house. And the VA and the FHA are huge into making sure that that does not happen. And so that is why they call for the painting the exterior trim, repairing the rotten wood, and for, you know, how the tub, how kids just splash water onto the floor. If it's not caulked or have shoe molding there, then and it's a surefire way in order for water to be able to get into the subfloor of the property. So that is um, uh, something that we, we need to keep in mind. What I forgot to first, because this is all new to me, so you have to, um, you have to forgive me. I'm new to all this. I wanted to do this one just for the heck. This is a word chart one. Um, and this one is, come on. Maybe I need to deactivate the other one. There we go. With me on Zoom, I think it works very fast. <laughs> um, might just skip that. So we'll just go on to the next thing. And I'll see if it pops up. So uh, the next thing that I was going to talk about is um, there's actually another, if we were doing this in uh, in a regular meeting, 
then I would um, have this for you as a magnet. And these are the top ways that you can help an appraiser, but you know, if you are like, well, what do we need to help an appraiser for? But okay, instead of helping an appraiser, <laughs> because you help an appraiser, you help your clients. And so if you look at it as helping your clients. And one of the first things, you're also gonna get a copy of this, is did you add the lot size to the listing? Um, can anyone tell me why that might be important? Some ideas? You can turn off your mic. You know, a quarter of an acre is a lot different than uh, the value of a three quarter acre lot. So mm -hmm. it is. So the, the yeah, it's, it's, any of those. Yeah. Do you know what I find amazing? Well, actually, there's two things. One thing is, is it's one of my statistical programs that I run will are automatically exclude properties where the MLS does not have the lot size. So it doesn't even include them in their statistical data. But the big thing is, is do you know that there is actually agents that do not put the acreage on country properties on the listing? They might have it in the writing, but they don't have it up where that acreage is or where the lot size is, which it just amazes me. How can, you know, if you have someone that's searching for a one to five acre, then how are they going to find you? So, um, and then when, like Jason said, is that when you have um, uh, in town properties, you want to be able to know the difference. You know, your client is going to want to know, hey, is it a bigger, like the biggest lot in the neighborhood? You know, because that's actually very appealing. So make sure that you're doing lot sizes on the list. The second one is mapped and geocoded correctly. Um, geocoding means um, that. Has anyone run across a listing that was not correctly located on the map? Our at office. All? Or am I the only one? Huh? Yes, occasionally. Um, I've seen properties in rain, you know, a local property, but it shows up on the map as somewhere out in the western part of the state. Yes. Um, so it's totally wrong. Yep. Yeah. Right. So A, people aren't going to be able to find your property if they just pull up the map that way. The second thing is, is what if you're scanning a property or looking for something that is, um, like, oh, let me get this general area. Let me find uh, comparables that are in this general area. So if you do a map, like you draw a map, guess what sale and listing is not going to be in that area? That property that is not geocoded correctly. And new construction is notorious for doing it this way. So make sure that you're um, geocoding your, um, like when you get your listing, uh, Jason, how does your office work, the um, listing input? Does the agent do it or is there someone that does it? Jason sure does it. There's truly. Yeah. Okay. It's all you, right? <laughs> so after station does it, go back and look at your listing and make sure that it is geocoded correctly. Like, oh, that is where the property is. Because you want to, your, um, your clients to have the best possible chance of selling the home. I know it's the market's a little crazy right now, but in yeah. general, that's a good thing to do. Right. Okay, the third thing that um, would be helpful. Yeah, go ahead. FYI, the there's there's like three options. One is I manually do it myself, and that's never going to happen. One is to do latitude and longitude. Again, never going to happen. Or click to automatically do it, and that's what Stacia does. Stacia clicks. Well, sure. Automatically. Absolutely. So most of the time it should yeah. be accurate based on the uh, address, should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean like my property, it works in Bing and it works if you use Waze, but Google does not work <laughs> with where I'm located. So just as a, just a quick thing, just check where the property is located and make sure the map is right in uh, the MLS system and that the tax truck is connected to it. That's another thing you want to make sure that you're doing. Um, a, re a picture of the rear of the house is another thing that appraisers would love because we want to know what is in the backyard. Is there a large deck or is it you write, is someone writes deck and then it ends up being four by four step down into the backyard or is it a large deck um things like that so that's i find very beneficial appraisers find very beneficial is to see the picture of the rear of the property and that benefits your clients because um they get to see what 
the back of the property looks like before they go. And it is um, not all the time. I mean, it's only like once every 20 listings I look at that doesn't have a picture of the back, which is then I have to call you to find out information if the city records doesn't have it. Because the city doesn't have to go in the backyard unless it's permitted. Um, you know, so they don't always get that information in city records. Having um, been um, worked for assessor's office, office for Virginia Beach assessor's office many years ago for five years. Um, the other one is just, this is just one to fill in the blanks, <laughs> but open the shower curtain a little bit. It doesn't have to be like wide open, but that way I know if it's fiberglass or ceramic tile, if there's any quality differences that I might want to look at. Um, the flood zone, um, uh, just, uh, I, I, when I have a flood zone, I like to have other comps and flood zones, um, but it's hard for me to know with a contract. I know there's something that states that the um, buyer's supposed to look at a flood zone map. I think it's on that list of, you know, along with like Megan's Law and stuff like that. Did you check this? Did you check this? Did you check this? Just kind of make sure and say, hey, let, why don't you take a look at a flood zone map? Just to make sure, you know, what you having to tell them what to do. At least they can check that off. Because um, what happens is, is what if the property, and this is the reason why, what if the property, um, you put in an offer and you find out after the fact that the um, property is in a flood zone? Was that offer really the correct offer if the people knew that there was a flood zone? Or are they caught now having to pay flood insurance and just choking on whatever they offered just because they don't want to um, get out of the deal? Um, so it's just, you want to make sure that the value that is being offered and the price that's being offered and things with flood insurance. Does everybody understand why or does anybody have any questions on that? Just to add on, Dawn is, is awesome at getting that to you. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. I was on the, um, on the, uh, Dawn, Dawn, in, Dawn is our insurance person and she had to jump off the call real quick. Um, she's going to try and come back in, but any property, Dawn will, you just email her the address and she'll send you, um, if it's in a flood zone. She'll give you okay, awesome. Email. So before you write contracts, you have that information available. Right. Okay, that's good to know because sometimes it doesn't and sometimes I'm not sure if an agent is telling me the truth. If I have to say, hey, did the buyer know before they put this offer in <laughs> that the house was um, in a flood zone? Because I want to know how much influence it had mm -hmm. with the value. Mm -hmm. All right, so, so let me Andy. scroll on down. Um, yeah. Hi, I'm Marvella. <clears throat> Have a question. Hi. So is that something you as the appraiser want to know? When you come out yes, for the appraiser? that would be great for us to know. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, that would be very helpful. Um, uh, because a lot of times we run our room to find the flood zone and then uh, the rain map is pretty daggone good. Um, at least for what I've seen for finding, you know, do y'all know there's a layer in the, on the rain map that shows flood zones? Yeah. Just for your own information. Did y'all know that? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, you just go to the map thing and there's that little layer thing and you press on that layer and it goes to the flood. So that's a super easy way to just see, hey, is this even like have a chance of flooding? <laughs> um, I mean, I personally wouldn't want to live in a flood zone, but you know, <laughs> I don't know other people, some neighborhoods, people don't seem to care. So um, Anyway, that's just something to take um, into consideration. And uh, this is modified a little bit in today's market, but the next one is that I give comps to the appraiser before or during the inspection and not the day after. And the reason for that is to give them ahead of time or the day of the inspection is um, we have to take our own comp picture. The mortgage company requires us to actually physically see the comparables that we use. And so if you're giving me comparables that for some reason I didn't find, then I'm comparable. And so if you give me the comps before or the day of, 
um, then I can take that picture while I'm out there. I might not use it, but I might take a picture just to have it in case I need it. Um, so anyway, so that's uh, something to take it into consideration. I know that there are plenty of grumpy appraisers out there that are just like, I don't want any comparables. But I mean, I don't see the big deal. Just take them. <laughs> What's a <the> big deal? <laughs> but um, oh, and the next thing is square footage. Can you see this whole thing on y'all screen? Um, and it says, uh, yeah. did I note the agent remarks where yeah. the living area yeah. having to call you? Because if it is different from city records, I, I mean, you know, if it's within 50 or square feet or 100 square feet, that's fine. You don't have to worry about that. But, or like rounding, that's fine. But if it's like two, three, a thousand square feet different, then I explain <laughs> in the agent remarks why it's different. It could be something as from previous, well, perfect, that's great. I will probably use the listing square footage. If it's from homeowner, not so great. <laughs> Cause I don't, I, you know, where did they get that number from, you know? And, um, uh, but at least I know so that then I can determine what I want to use as a square footage for that particular comparable. Um, just things like that, it just make it really super clear and it keeps you from getting calls from the appraiser. If you just um, write a, just a one sentence explanation up there in that agent remarks section, that would be fantastic. Um, rotten wood and peeling paint required, okay? If there's rotten wood and peeling paint, just get it and fix it. I know it's hard, that's why I'm giving you that FHA checklist. Blame it on the appraiser, if, especially if they get their FHA loans. It's gonna have to be done. I mean, personally, I would think a home would sell better if all that work was done. It shows pride of ownership, it shows that you take care of your property. And um, people get the assumption that you, if you take care of that stuff, then you take care of other stuff. And so it just seems to me it would be a good marketing strategy to go ahead and have that stuff finished. Um, oh, oh, and then a repeat. <laughs> it's super important. I repeated this. Did I note in the agent remarks where the living area came from? Just want to make sure you get that. <laughs> That would be great. So um, that is uh, some things that um, I'm trying to think what else I have. Okay, here's all the stuff. So those are the biggest things that I see in terms of um, information that would be very beneficial to the appraiser. Um, do we want to take uh, questions at this time. I also have a little thing on price per square foot. If we're going to do that, and take questions. I wasn't sure how much time you had, Jason, for this or what you want me to do. Uh, just so everybody knows, I did just upload the five um, items that were in the email that I never received. Um, so. you can't Jake sent to him on a Sunday, so. Well, I mean, he probably forgot. <laughs> um, oh, Angie, well. I have a Angie, I have a question in reference to um, rooms, bedrooms, mm -hmm. bedrooms with a closet with a window, without a closet, without a window. What would help, help us? Okay. okay, bedrooms do not have to have a closet. You're going to have some appraisers that go, oh, it has to have a closet. No, it doesn't. Um, regs do not require closets, but they do require square footage and access um, and privacy. I'm not even sure if privacy is on there, but Obviously, it needs to have privacy. I had a homeowner one time yell and scream at me about a, um, a loft that was fully exposed to downstairs. I mean, there wasn't even like a half wall or a three-quarter wall. It was a full-blown loft with little rooms and stuff. And he's like, that's a bedroom. And I'm like, no, it's not. Would you change your clothes there? <laughs> I mean, really? <laughs> so, um, but the biggest thing is, is that it needs to be at least 70 to 80 square feet. It has to be big enough to hold a bed. It is, doesn't mean that it's 70 by one foot. It means it's big enough to hold a bed and have a little bit of walking space around it. Okay. So it needs to be 70 to 80 square feet and it needs to have access to a window um, mm -hmm. as a second requirement. It does not mean that it has to have a closet and it needs to make logical sense that that would be a bedroom. You know, um, 
sometimes I count things. It, it's not like a lot of times I make adjustments for bedroom count unless like five and six bedrooms. I'm not going to make an adjustment for, you know, five versus six. Um, I, I probably will for a two versus three or a, um, a possibly a three versus four if there's not an extra room for office space. Um, if there's extra room for office space, um, it seems like three and fours don't make too much difference as long as there's a place for them, extra space um, for them to be able to put stuff. If the room count is low, then it's different from what I get. But in terms of a bedroom, it does not need to have a closet. It needs to have the square footage. It needs to have access to a window so that there's an escape for a fire. Thank mm -hmm. you. I have a question about square footage. And so what determines whether or not the appraiser measures the home's square footage? Um, in terms of living area, like what's counted as living area, yeah. it needs to be heated. Um, I am, okay, I'm going to do one thing first. Um, like a room over the garage, um, for me, it's, it, it's supposed to be, it's five feet, anything five feet and higher. So basically my shoulder and higher is what I count as living area. So if it has those slanted walls on the side, basically just go five feet up and it, you know, out from the wall, and then you measure to the other part where it slants to about five feet. And that's all considered living area. It's not wall to wall in those particular situations. Um, now in terms of a closed porches, we all handle it differently, I will say. Um, if I have a cheaper enclosed porch that's really not the same quality as the rest of the house, even if it has heating, I might not count it as living area, but make a big explanation on the, on the, um, down in the side, even though it could technically be part of living area because it is heated. Because um, I don't think a client would see it as living area. They would see it as like a sunroom or like, if it's had that cheap siding and stuff, they're not going to use that room all the time, even if it's heated. Um, so I will sometimes make exceptions in that rule, but basically it doesn't even have to be cold. It's um, because there's still some houses that don't have a AC, central air conditioning. Um, so it has to have a heat source though. And that's how we determine it. Basically five feet and up and a heat source are the biggest determiners. Does that help at all? It does, yeah. Um, can I? I want to follow that up with: uh, uh, Are you are in an appraisal? Are you supposed to provide a diagram of the property so it's thirty feet wide, it's forty feet deep, it's you know L shaped, that sort Absolutely. of thing? Absolutely. And do you actually draw that graph mm -hmm. every, at every appraisal? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yep. The only appraisals I don't do that in are um, like nowadays we just have to draw the footprint because we don't go in the houses technically we could go in the houses if we wanted to but um, right when the governor had that last thing I think at the end of March I was just doing an appraisal and it was my last interior inspection and the people were 95 years old and I'm like no I'm not doing any more interior inspections because I don't want to take the risk of me having carried it in to them and to be responsible. And so from that day forward, I do exterior. And so in our situation right now, it, we just have to measure the, like for VA, we have to measure the outside of the house and provide a footprint to make sure that the city records are reasonable. But in this situation, it's, it's definitely more um, geared to previous appraisals that you have. That would be super handy for an appraiser, guys, uh, is if, um, in today's market is if you also had a previous appraisal on the property because that would give us our square footage, especially if it's different than the city, if it's not obvious from the outside what the square footage is, that would be very beneficial, especially, you know, if it's significantly different than the city. Um, that actually, I did an appraisal and I did not do city records. I did the previous appraisal. It was a thousand square feet difference. Um, and so I used the appraisal and that's the reason I was able, if it would have been a thousand square feet smaller, I would never have been able to appraise it for what it did. Right. If I go by city records. So thankfully those people had a previous appraisal that I could rely upon. Um, so yes, definitely ask clients for previous appraisal because of that sketch 
the comps and stuff aren't going to matter, but that sketch is super important in this market. And speaking of um, that and modifications that we do, um, since we don't most, are, is anybody, I don't see everybody on the screen, so you're going to have to apologize for that. But um, uh, are there um, people still that have appraisers that are doing interiors in town? Can you just say it because I can't see your hand, all of your hands for some reason. No, all mine are outside. Okay. I was pretty sure with the governor's order that that would kind of restrict it to exteriors. And um, I know that there are some mortgage companies that are still asking appraisers to go inside because I see it on the forums, but I don't work for those kind of people. <laughs> that um so i don't know for me myself personally whether they still do that or not um but there are fantastic apps out now to help the appraiser to do their job without having to go into a home listings are super simple because we can look um, at the mls pictures to be able to get the information but if there's refinances um like there's I know of four programs out there, which are an app on your phone, and you can just, um, the homeowner can just input all the information, take pictures. They even, um, the pictures um, have to be um, GPS um, coded. So it has to come from that property and there's time stamped so that we know that it's coming from that house and not them going to, you know, two neighbors down where they've remodeled the kitchen. <laughs> So that's the best that we can do. And I know VA is not doing match out refinances right now because especially if, I, if I'm not mistaken, it's like 90, anything over, you know, I think it was already 90%, but I think they're just limiting cash out refinances right now because they don't want that run that risk since we don't know the interior condition and the square footage very well on uh, getting that information. So that's something else that we're doing different. Um, I have a question about otherwise the, well, it's, actually maybe more of a comment. So, I mean, I think that uh, since we're doing more and more exterior only appraisals uh, that would lend itself to the use of professional photography. And I think that would be really be a, that would be an advantage, I think, to your seller to be able to provide high quality photos to the appraiser uh, who's making that determination. So uh, just, a, just a tip there to, uh, to try to stick yeah. with professional Especially photography. Especially if you you're having... <laughs> Possible. Yeah, especially if, uh, um, I mean, the market, I mean, there are like little niches of the market that are not doing that hot. They're doing well, but not as hot. Um, but then there's some, I don't know about y'all, but because it seems to me, I can get y'all's opinion, that the limited inventory is creating, and, and high demand is creating this feeding frenzy sometimes in some neighborhoods. Would you all agree with that? Or what are y'all seeing? For sure. Yeah. Yeah, I'm seeing that too. Yeah. Oh. Hey, Angie, I have a quick question for you. Um, and I know every appraiser is different, but because y'all aren't going right. in houses, I feel like we may be seeing some lower appraisals because you're not seeing it one-on-one. -on -one. Pictures don't always exactly. tell a thousand words. What if we, if we do get a low appraisal, in your opinion, what should we provide to you, the appraiser, to say, this is why we think it's this, this price? This always comes up. <laughs> so I have created a PDF Sorry. for that. No, no, it's fine. This is why I do it. I created a PDF. And if you go into the chat up at the top, the very first thing I put in there was a link. And you click on that link and you sign up and you get a PDF of appealing or appraisal. Um, so I actually created exactly the that you need to make in order to appeal the appraiser. The agent technically is not supposed to be the appraiser, but they can give them all the information to the buyer. <laughs> and the buyer talks to the work company is the way it's supposed to run. Um, but yes, that would be really helpful. Just look on the link that's in the chat up at the top. I don't, I don't think there's any more chats in there. I don't. No, oh, it's in there. It's like a top. And then. It's in there. I see it. Okay. Yeah. It's a flow desk link. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. So you just uh, click on that and uh, you will get a emailed copy of that report to be able to help you. 
Um, yeah, any other questions? Cool. Oh, I'm still, okay. I didn't realize that I was still doing that. So um, any other questions out there that you can think of? So the, um, obviously I need, I need to look at that, let, check out that PDF uh, for appealing an appraisal. But, um, but would you say that, um, you know, are you seeing more appraisals come in less or are we, are, do you see the market is fairly consistent now in appraised to sale price or contract price? Um, um, I just did two that I appraised higher than contract because they went under contract and then <laughs> the neighborhood went crazy. <laughs> so um, I have only had one that has in this, this spring market that was questionable on whether I needed to come in lower or um, at the sales price because it was a property that was at the absolute peak in Aragona, you know, it was close to breaking the 300s and that just typically is not the case. <laughs> so um, yeah, so that one was um, difficult, but that is the only one that I found that has um, not been able to be supported with pendings and listings. Hopefully appraisers are looking at pendings and listings um, to, sh to help bracket that number. Because a lot, you know, closed sales, yes, has to have the most significance, um, but definitely listings and pendings help to determine the trajectory of the market. And that's what I do. The spring market is usually means I have five or six comps or more <laughs> on my grid instead of just the typical three in order to prove, to prove it. Cause that's our job is, is we work for the client, which is our mortgage company. It is not the buyer, it is the mortgage company. And so our job is to make sure the mortgage company knows what's going on with the house, what needs to happen, and is um, the value reasonable. So a lot of times in my appraisals, I'll write that the contract is reasonable, just to show that, you know, it's in the ballpark of what it needs to be. And mortgage companies now can check up on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you, um... Do you, so if, um, if we come across a property that we feel like, you know, maybe there's not a lot of good comps for it and uh, we're struggling to come up with a potential list price for this property, um, do you offer a service where you would uh, maybe consult with the agent to help them uh, get in the ballpark of an appropriate list price? Question that's always asked. <laughs> in that email is a flyer that I have created. Um, let me get that for you. Um, let me reduce the size. Hold on one sec. Um, share my screen. Okay, there we go. Um, I have, do you have, uh, appraisal services? I have on the back of this, I have one, two, it's $210 because it's an extra 5% to take care of the credit card charge because I can charge for it. So I just add the 5% to it. So it's basically a $200 appraisal. You get very little. You basically get a number and possibly the comps I used. Um, if we want to call and talk about it, you could do that, you know, um, kind of thing. But that means that I have not measured the house, that you are think. The city, you know, it's a fairly reasonably easy house to look at and determine that it's on um, the square footage is probably pretty reasonable. And so it's basically a desktop. And then you can send me pictures. I have an app that you can use to make it super simple if there's pictures that you want to send me or information that you want to send me. So it's a lot easier than it was a week ago. I had an agent a week ago and it's just, it was used to be laborious. Um, but now it's much simpler now that people that already had these apps kind of in the back burner you know, with COVID, they're like, whoop, here you go. <laughs> so I have an app that helps get me the information that I need in order to do a desktop appraisal. Now, if you feel like you need your home measured, then it will cost more because then it's the cost of me coming out there. And usually that I tend to go to the city one week in order to manage my time better because I do such a large area. I'm in Western Suffolk, out in the country, so basically everything's 45 minutes for me. 
I used to live in Chesapeake, but we got to the country. So I'll do to the north, like Smithfield, um, maybe North Suffolk, and maybe I'll pop down to Southampton all in one day. I'll do North Carolina, Southern Suffolk another day. I'll do Virginia Beach, Norfolk another day, that kind of stuff. So um, if you need me to come out, just keep in mind to be fairly flexible, then I only go to certain areas once or twice a week. Um, and then I can measure the house for you and you'll have the measurements, you know, the outside measurements, the general locations of where the bedrooms and baths are. I don't do the real detailed sketches. Sketching is not my favorite thing to do, <laughs> but I do it. <laughs> and, um, and then I provide that service and then a general rundown of the information. But the full blown appraisal, like with all everything that you normally get from mortgage company is not what it's going to look like. So don't think that you're going to get, that $500 product for 200 because <laughs> um, there's a lot more work that goes into it, but it ended up being the same number, whichever one, like for the $200 one, I just make some handwritten notes and I just make adjustments on that MLS sheet. I'll just print it off and make the adjustments so I don't have to type everything up and do explanations. And that's what keeps the price down is all the extra typing that I don't have to do. Um, you have a, um, do you have, is, does is there a cheat sheet so to speak uh quote unquote with respect to uh you know what's the difference between a one car garage and a two car garage or a brick front house as opposed to uh an all brick house or a vinyl sided house or you know how much is a half bath worth compared to a full or three quarter bath are there some maybe rules of thumb that, uh, that you use and is there maybe a document available to help agents when they're making adjustments? No, there is not because it depends on the neighborhood. It depends on your price range of your home. So I don't wanna say, oh, well, across the board it's this. It really isn't. Um, for example, I have a video, I have a, um, a Facebook group called Ask an Appraiser. I'm not super into it right now, but I, there's a history of um, videos and write-ups that help you know what questions to ask. Um, uh, like if you have a private lane, what are some things that you need to know when you list it, when the appraiser comes out of the title company so nobody's surprised <laughs> that right before closing, hey, we don't have legal access, <laughs> things like that. But you know, it has all this information. It's called Ask an Appraiser Hampton Roads on Facebook. And in that, I do a short video on, for example, kitchens, what's the adjustment for condition kitchens. Um, the problem is I live in a neighborhood. It's a condo neighborhood where it was extracted that the kitchen upgrade was only $4,000 and they did all the kitchen. They remodeled the kitchen, the bathrooms, the floor, everything. And that condo only sold for $4,000 more than another condo, just like it with nothing updated. Um, versus, you know, you have the really high end properties where you could have a hundred thousand dollar difference, you know, based on the upgrades. So there's no consistent thing that you can do. Um, we do have like, if the home is the middle of the road, like the 200 to $400,000 range, um, you know, that excludes like, like waterfront and super large lots and things like that. We do have an idea of what to do. Um, in terms of that, I will give you one um, adjustment that I tend to use across the board in that price range. And it's the one car versus the two car. Now, one car, I do, I do, I tend to do it by square footage and not base um, uh, because a one car garage is usually around 200, 250 square feet. A two car garage is usually 400 square feet or 400 to 500 square feet. And so, um, cause that's enough to fit two cars in there. So it generally, if you literally have a very physically one car versus two car, and it is a completely middle-class neighborhood, it's about $5,000 um, for a space is what tends to adjust out very well across the board in that general category. And then if there's different driveway spaces, one driveway versus another, it's probably, a, you give a little bit more because there's more driveway space. So I'm going to park off the street. So, but that's one. And um, I have, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I should probably stop share. Um, I have this, um, 
uh, agents give me listings in proof based on price per square foot. And so I threw together some stuff real quick of just some things, appraisals that I already had open. And I wanted to show you how price per square foot is not the best measure of um, like taking that entire price per square foot. An appraiser never does that. Um, and so I wanted to show you why that is the case. And so I'm gonna screen share this and show you why price per square foot is not really the way to go, but you can use that price per square foot to come up with a living area adjustment. So um, for example, this is a home. Uh, so last year, I think, um, it's a manufactured home, so the price per square foot is small and it's in Gates County. And um, look at the price per square foot is $78.69.69, okay? The subject is 1782 square feet. This comp is 1728, and that's $78. $2,200, $2,000, both have the lower price per square foot, and that's generally how it runs. The larger the home, the less per square foot it has. Um, just because of the economies of scale, it takes less money to add that extra square footage. And so that is generally like, if you take out, okay, let me do go back. That $78 includes the land. You cannot do a price per square foot for another house because it includes the land. It includes how many garage spaces it has. As it includes this, this uh, does it have a screen porch and a deck and a porch versus one that doesn't? It's all going to go into that price per square foot. And so, what you need to do instead is you look at your comparables and you see which one is most like the subject, the one that you want to list, which property is most like it. And um, for example, this comp one is most like it. It has the same condition and everything, same similar acreage. So guess what adjustment I'm gonna go buy? Is that $78 a square foot? Um, in our area, um, the that is not what the adjustment I make for living area adjustments. What I do is I take that $78 and in our area, every area has something different. And if it's a normal size lot, if it's non-waterfront, you can usually take 40 to about 40% of that $78, and that is your price per square foot that you would use. So 78 times 0.4 is gonna give me $31. So I will use a $31 adjustment on my comparables. And that's um, when I've done extraction and things like that for your normal Joe Schmo neighborhood, this works. Um, it's just an easy, quick way to get a number, like an idea. I've done the extractions with statistics and they always like pretty much drop in. Now there's other parts of the country where it's not 40%, it might be 45% or 50%. And I wanna show you where it's not going to work, okay? This is Susan Constant Drive. It is um, Princess Anne Hills um, at the oceanfront. And this particular one, uh, so I took out all my adjustments <laughs> so you couldn't get distracted with that. And okay, so we got a 4,000 square foot house here, 41, 40, 44. All right, look at the price per square footage, 163, 238, 190. So which one are you gonna use? <laughs> Do you see how that's not gonna work? Mm -hmm. If you get into neighborhoods that are not consistent, they don't have um, consistent information. And so there are plenty, plenty of times where the price per square foot, even taking a percentage of 40% or something like that, or if it's waterfront, you even go lower than that because you know most of the value of that property is in the land. Um, but I can narrow it down. This is not waterfront as a water view, but it doesn't is not waterfront. So that 190 is gonna tell me that that's a pretty uh, daggone close idea of it takes out that land difference of the water versus non water And you could probably um, adjust based on that 190 because this 238 includes waterfront. This 163 is a larger house, so it's gonna have a lower price per square foot. And so I don't know, I probably confused the crap out of you, but <laughs> that it's just a way to, to, for, to physically show you that it doesn't 
work all the time and you can't rely on it. Um, because I do get comps based on square footage and the, the house is not from agents. The house is nothing like the subject, but they just like, oh, well this proves it because they can get the number to match what the house went under contract for or you know the high listing and it just doesn't work that way and the appraiser does not work that way. So um, I'm actually thinking about doing a class on thinking like an appraiser, you know, what an appraiser looks for and how to run the best comps for that appraiser. Uh, yeah, I so, have one more question. Anyway, if, uh, so does that help it, at all? It does actually. Yeah, I, I have one more question if you mm -hmm. don't mind. I know we're we've oh, gone over mm -hmm. our time, so thank you for for your patience. But um, something I see quite a bit um, in Suffolk and Smithfield area is, uh, for example, there's a new listing on Scotts Factory Road uh, over where I live, and uh, it's a five acre parcel, and so. Is, is it true that only the first acre carries the most value? And then after that, all of the subsequent acres, whether it's four or 24, they're considered at a much yes. lesser yes, value. Yes, absolutely. Okay. If you look at the land sales, all you have to do is pop up, um, every appraisal I do out in the country especially, I pop up the land sales and I sort them by acreage. And then you can see, like, I mean, there's always anomalies, <laughs> but um, in general, you'll see that that first acre might be, you know, 35,000. And then after that, it might only be five to $7,000 more an acre after that. Um, it just depends on what city you're in. But yeah, yeah, actually, that is the case. Is it a new listing or one that sold in December? Um. No, this is uh, this is a brand new listing. Kathy okay. just put up um, Sacone over there, but um, but I think I may know the one that you're referring to uh, over there. Uh, we did have another mm -hmm. one with five acres recently sell on that street. Yeah, so uh, so yeah, my, I was I was curious about that because when I'm looking at comps, I, I always take into consideration that first acre as being the most valuable. Yes. Uh, so. Well, I, uh, I will say in I Chesapeake, because the zoning is different, if I'm not mistaken, it's the first three acres. And then afterwards, out in the, further out in the country, you know, the zoning is less requirements for what your minimum acreage is to build on. So just keep that in mind, too, that if the zoning says you can't build a house on one acre, then it's going to start at three acres. Very good to know. Good to know. Well, thank you, Angie, so much for being here. Really, really appreciate it. I think that uh, we've all gotten something valuable out of this. Um, and I would encourage everybody to go to that link and uh, get that book on how to uh, best appeal an appraisal that might come in low for your seller. So uh, um, if you have no further questions, we'll let you go, Angie. Thank you all. All right. Thanks. Good to see everybody today. Thank you. You have a good day. Thank Thanks, you. Angie. Bye-bye.